worship. you and to thank you. You gave up everything for us and we are so grateful and we just, we, we pray for all men, Lord, and we hope that this worship you find satisfactory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.
song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist, and today uh, we are we don't have as many things on our uh, schedule as we normally do. Seems like we're getting back to the uh, fall season and uh, a little bit uh, calmer things. But had a great time for all of you who came to the uh, uh, church picnic yesterday. Uh, we've had a, had a lot of fun. Had a good number of people, some good uh, sports, but especially a good fellowship sitting around talking, and uh, that was terrific. Um, the main thing we want to mention on this uh, is that uh, about the anniversary celebration, I'm going to wait until right after the morning the offering to mention that. So if the guys will come down, let's have the uh, offering first, and uh, let's have the word of prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you for the privilege of being able to serve you and love you and being able to give towards you. We, your work, we ask that as we uh, contribute, that you might help us to use every penny in order to spread the word to those not only in our own backyard, 
not only here in the United States, but also abroad and around the world. We thank you for our missionaries that are serving uh, around the world, some of them in different time zones right now. Some have already completed their worships, and some of them still have their worship services to come. But we ask that you might bless us this day, that we might spread your gospel and be a witness for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, 110th anniversary, pick, anniversary celebration coming up October 12th. Now, we would like everybody to come, okay? Uh, we've tried to, we've reduced the tickets beyond what the church costs, you know, $40. So we're getting down to $25 because we'd like everybody to come. If you still can't come because of finances, please talk to us. But we'd love to have you sign up. It's on the 12th of October, not this Saturday, but the following Saturday. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, I have a Christian comedian coming in. Um, but you're not coming to hear him. It's just going to be an exciting night. We're going to show some of the history of the church. I'll go back 110 years. Uh, we'll have some testimonies. We'll do a little bit of singing. And just be, it'll be a great night. And um, probably the next one of these, I'm, I don't know, I'm guessing probably be 125 years, which will be 15 years down the road. Hope I'm still here. I mean, not preaching, but alive. <laughs> But at any rate, so you got a long time to go before you find another one of these. So the last one was a really a great time of celebration, and this one would be also. So you're not going to want to miss it. So if you're able to sign up, it's on October 12th from 5 to um, 9 in the evening. Um, I get out a little bit earlier, but we're going to start at 5 o'clock. It's a Yardley Country Club, $25. You, you can't beat it. And please sign up. We uh, have, I think, 77 signed up so far, but we've promised 100, so we're paying for 100 anyway. So please sign up and help us uh, make our numbers, but that's not my biggest concern. My biggest concern is that you'll miss this occasion because it won't be repeated. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So at any rate, please sign up for that if you would, please. And um, we'd, uh, there's, I think there's sign-ups outside back here. Somebody will be sitting out there, and uh, please uh, sign up today. God bless you, and let's have a great day as we worship God. Worship team. Oh
There's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Sean, I don't get this. Is this because of the baptism last week? Is that what it is? Supposed to be baptized? Oh, okay. I, I'm trying to think, what is this, what is this comic? I'm quite not, I'm, I was tr- spending all the first service trying to figure it out. So, okay. How many people went to the baptism last week? Saw it. Anybody down here? I'll tell you, you missed something great. It was, it was a terrific time down there. Um, you know, we had um, Carolyn and uh, get baptized, Carolyn, and then her granddaughter, Dee, who sits in the back. They're both here in the first service, and Shane, her husband. And um, um, Carolyn, he gave her testimony. In fact, I got it on my phone. I got to upload that probably to the website or something. But, uh, you know, uh, 77 years old, baptized in the river. Let me tell you. Uh, you know, you just, the, the joy, the excitement, you just can't, you can't beat it, you know. And so I'm sorry you'll miss it if you come down. But uh, when we have those river baptisms, they don't happen, happen very often. You, you need to come down and really enjoy it and, and support the people that are there because it's really a great, oh, Jim's bringing me some water. My, my throat is a little bit. At the end of the vodka. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay, well, good. Um, what, is t- what is tonight, starts tonight at sundown and goes to the bar? Now, I know, uh, you know, I, I know you have no hints at all, so what is it? Rosh Hashanah, yeah, how about that? Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you're also intelligent beings and so aware of the activities taking place in, 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 around you. Um, Rosh Hashanah uh, starts on the first day of the seventh month of the Jewish calendar, okay? Um, and we'll, I'm gonna, I'll, talk, I'll give you just a slight bit of background as we start, but then I want you to, I'm, I'm going to play a little video for here that will kind of give you a little synopsis of, of it better than I could ever would as far as starting out. But um, the Jews have, the Jewish system has like three or four different New Years, okay? This is one of them. Uh, this is possibly the most important one, and it happens on the first day of the seventh month. Why might that be important? 
seven, seven, seven is the perfect number, number of completion, you know. So for the Jews, the first day of the seventh month is very important. And so this is their Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah. We'll see that it's in the Old Testament in some places, and we'll, we'll discuss that later on. Um, you might say, why do they have four? Well, they have one also in the beginning of the year, where, or more March, April, uh, the first month of the year, the month Nisan. And um, that's kind of like when, they, when they're uh, saying how long kings served, they'd use that as they, they started their kingship. And this year, went to that year, they start the March, April one. This one's more of the legal, um, the legal, has legal ramifications. So if they did a contract or something or a deed of some sort, a lot of times they use this particular date, the seventh month, first day of the seventh month as being important. And that's what they used it for. So you'll find that that becomes important. In the United States, we do the same thing, don't we? We got a bunch of New Year's. Well, you don't think about it that way, but when's, our, when's, the, when's New Year's for us? January 1st. When's another New Year? July 1st for some companies, right? They start, or October 1st, it's coming up on Tuesday. The government, everybody has these fiscal years, okay? Um, how many people are school teachers or, go to, or are attending school? Anybody? Raise your hand if you're a school teacher, if you attend school. Okay. When do your year start? <laughs> September, basically, right? It's the school year. Some of us, have, we have our birth years, you know? So, so there are very different kinds of years, and such is true in the Hebrew society, and that they've got a number of them, but this is one of the most important ones. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about this particular one today, and, and as I said, the video that I found could say it a lot better, so I'm gonna let you listen to that one first, and then I'll kind of come back, and we'll repeat some of the stuff, and show some of the stuff that's important, and add to it a little bit. So if you guys will start that video, please. Rosh Hashanah is the start of a new year in the Jewish calendar and a moment to take stock of your soul. Unlike January 1st, it's serious stuff. It's said that on this day, God takes special note of us and our behaviors, writing us into the book of life. It's time for reflection. Where have you missed the mark? How can you grow and improve yourself this year? Where do you need to seek forgiveness? The last line of the poem read on Rosh Hashanah, the Unatana Tokef, is a super concise guide to how we start the new year off right. Teshuva and Tefila and Sadaka. Teshuva and Tefila and Sadaka. Let's break those down. Tshuva, the word for spiritual realignment, comes from a Hebrew root that means return. It gets translated usually as repentance. It's more like remembering who you truly are and striving to return there. Rosh Hashanah is actually a step along in the process of Tshuva, which starts a month earlier on the first of Elul and then kicks into high gear with the high holidays. Rosh Hashanah is two days long. It's full of food, prayer, and some creative rituals. Its name means head of the year and has a lot of other names too. The meals are a big deal. Dinners and lunches. Most memorable is the blessing over apples dipped in honey for a sweet new year. You'll also see round halas, sometimes with raisins, honey cake, sweet foods like honey carrots, kugels, tzimis. Plus, some people have a tradition of eating new fruits, a fiesta of things to taste for the first time in the new year. Sephardi Jews have a Rosh Hashanah Seder, including foods with names that are puns in Hebrew. For instance, the head of a fish gives you an excuse to say so that we may be like the head and not the tail. It's like saying get your head in the game. When you see people on Rosh Hashanah at synagogue or on the street, you can shout out Shana Tova or Shana Tova, which just means have a good year. Speaking of synagogue, if you go, you'll encounter a lot of special liturgy in a book called the Holiday Machzor. This is Tefillah, connecting through prayer. A highlight for many is singing the beloved melody, Avinu Malkeinu. You'll also hear the Torah stories of Abraham and Sarah, Hagar and Ishmael, and the famous Binding of Isaac story. And you'll hear the sounding of the shofar, Tukia, that's the one little one. <coughs> then Shivari, that's a threefer. <coughs> and then there's Trua, and that's like a machine gun. <coughs> And then the long one, Gadola, comes from Gadol, which means big. And it's long. And then everyone sings, It's unbelievable. You're going to love it. You should really just come out and check it out anyway. If you've got to come once a year, might I recommend Shabbat, though? It's a much easier time to get through. I'm just saying, I'm not here to push a narrative or an agenda, but Shabbat's fun.
In the Torah, hearing the cries from a ram's horn is a key mitzvah, or commandment, of Rosh Hashanah. The 100 shofar blasts, there are three types, are meant to arouse and to awaken each person. There's a beautiful daytime ritual that is very engaging for kids called tashlich. People toss breadcrumbs into a nearby body of water to symbolically cast away old habits and mistakes. Rosh Hashanah is also a time of year to consider how to do more tzedakah, justice in the world, through community projects, taking a stand on important issues, or giving charity, say after the high holiday appeal to your synagogue. At the new year, we turn the pages of our own life's book, be it tattered, torn, or terrific. Rosh Hashanah is an auspicious moment in time that invites us to wonder, what's the next chapter in my life all about? True eye. <laughs> and then the big one. Takiya <laughs> Gadola. You can explain a little better, but uh, we'll we'll talk about a few of those things because I've heard it like four times now. You know, a couple times getting ready and then here. So every time I hear it, something else comes up. So you're not gonna remember all that stuff, but I'll point out some things that I think are pretty important. And if you take your notes that I have in your Bible, uh, in your uh, bulletins there, and take a look at them, I have. We're gonna start off with some biblical references in the Torah. Now, what is the Torah? Or Torah, first five books, also called the. Pentateuch, okay? Pentecost, Old Testament law. Pentateuch for Pentagon, Penta, five. Okay, first five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So we're going to look at the first one, and that's going to be in the, um, if you take a look at uh, Leviticus, it's on your sheet if you want to look at it there. It's also up here on the, uh, on the um, video ahead of you. And it reads this way. And this is the first mention of this particular um, uh, occasion or this particular uh, holiday. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the moon, you shall have a rest, a reminder, by blowing of trumpets, which is the ram's horn, a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work, but you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. And so <clears throat> this becomes the first uh, commandment to, be, uh, to make the first day of the seventh month a holy day. Now they call Rosh Hashanah. It was never called Rosh Hashanah back then. That's kind of something that means head of the, head of the uh, day, but um, it, they had no name for it back then in that way. It's just a, one, of the, one of the feast days. So that is one of the places it's mentioned. It's also mentioned in the book of Numbers. And this is a little more extensive one. I've put a little bit of a synopsis in your particular um, hand out there, but this is the full thing. So I want you to stand and read this with me if you would. So let's, let's read this section from uh, Numbers 29 together. When we're finished this, we'll take a look a little bit more at it. <coughs> Say it with me. Now, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall also have a holy convocation. You shall do no laborious work. It will be a day, day for blowing trumpets. You shall offer a burnt offering as a soothing aroma to the Lord. One bull, one ram, and seven male lambs, one year old without defect. Also their grain offering, fine flour mixed with oil, three-tenths of an ephah for the bull, ten-tenths for the ram, and one-tenth for each of the seven lambs. Offer one male goat for a sin offering to make atonement for you, besides the burnt offerings of the new moon and its grain offerings, and the continual burnt offerings and its grain offering, and their drink offerings according to their ordinance for a soothing aroma and offering by fire to the Lord. Okay, you may be seated, and you see that there it talks about having a, an offering for the new moon. And so um, when we're talking, the, the calendars are based on lunar months. And so consequently, this would be a new moon. So the new moon, would, you'd have the, the blowing the shofar and the, and, the, and the sacrifices. So there are a number of things that happen on the first day of each month. But on the seventh month, this is a special ho a holiday, a special convocation, a holy day. And so that's what we're looking for, looking at when we're looking at this particular section as we, as we go through it. So the, uh, this particular holiday you find in one other spot in the Old Testament, and it's when it's observed. 
And so you see in the things we talked about today how it's observed, but let's look at the time it was observed. If you remember, we were all back in, uh, a while back we went to Ezra and Nehemiah and did a lot of uh, study there. We're going to go back to Ezra, uh, Nehemiah chapter 8. So turn to Nehemiah chapter 8, okay? Find it in your Bibles. I want you to take a look at this and pull out a pew Bible if you don't have one yourself, okay? Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah. Nehemiah, okay? So if you find it, um, please go there because you're gonna, I'm going to look at a few things there. If you don't have your Bible open, you may not understand them a whole lot, so just listening is not going to help. We're going to go back to chapter 7 and start with chapter 7, okay? Um, we're going to give a little bit of a, of, a, of a context for this. When you were going through Ezra and Nehemiah, if you remember, the temple had been destroyed, the, um, the walls were destroyed, everything was gone. And so um, Nehemiah got, he was the cupbearer for the king. And the cupbearer does what? What's the cupbearer do? Taste the wine. Why? See, it was poisonous. How many want the cupbearer's job? You drink wine and, and hope that it's not poisonous to just kill the king. Anybody want that job? <laughs> you know? Get a lot of wine, I guess, but, uh, you know, today could be your last taste. Uh, so, at any rate, um, Nehemiah's job was that. He found out that they had built the temple, you know, they rebuilt the temple, uh, so forth, but that the walls were still uh, down and that the people were at, at a loss. And so he wanted to go back and take care of that. And so in going back, um, Ezra went back, um, actually Nehemiah went back and they built, started building the walls. Then Ezra went back and taught the people. And then we have the second part of Nehemiah. So actually chapters like one through six or so, uh, the first half of Nehemiah. Then we put in the book of Ezra, goes into that next part. And then we start back with the seventh and eighth book, uh, eighth chapter and so forth of Nehemiah for the rest of the story. We're jumping in in chapter seven. And actually I want you to look at just a briefly at chapter six. Chapter six, verse 15 says, so the wall was completed in the 25th of the month, Elul, in the 52 days. So they finished the, so the whole chapter here is trying to talk, the whole first part of Nehemiah is talking about building this wall in 52 days. Now what was the month that it said it's talking about there? Elul, okay? Have you heard about that before? Have you heard that today in today's sermon or any place today? And the video, thank you, okay? And if you remember, the month leading up to the seventh month, the sixth month was the month of Elul. And in this particular month, they blow the shofar, shofar once every day as a preparation as you're getting ready for Rosh Hashanah, okay? Which is a day of repentance and getting ready to have the Day of Atonement, which is when? Ten days later, okay? Yom Kippur. Okay, so Yom Kippur is coming. So that, and, and actually, we're going to talk about Rosh Hashanah today. And I've asked Pastor Rob to come back next week and talk about Yom Kippur because being from Brooklyn, a lot of Jewish uh, history there in, in Brooklyn, a lot of uh, Jewish folks and so forth, uh, I think I'll have a great perspective on Yom Kippur next week as we look at it. And that is when it is actually next Wednesday. So um, a lot of you people are off school probably tomorrow uh, on Monday. How many people off? Uh, yep, no school, okay. And that's why, because... Rosh Hashanah, okay? They have two days. Anybody have two days off, Monday and Tuesday? Monday and Tuesday, okay? The holiday is really, uh, it, they celebrate it for two days. My understanding, as best, I could, as best I could find out, was that they were a little unsure of when the lunar month started or whatever, and, and around the world it's different places or whatever. So it sounds like outside of Israel it's celebrated for two days, which is Monday and Tuesday, which starts on Sunday night tonight. But in Israel it's celebrated for one day. That may not be true, but that's what I read, and I think that's about right. But it's basically a two-day holiday because of that. So we're going to pick this up. In chapter 6, verse 15, they finished the wall. Jump with me down to chapter 7, verse 1. Now it came about when the wall was rebuilt, and I had set up the doors, and the gatekeepers, and the singers, and the Levites were appointed. So all the ministers to celebrate worship were appointed. But I put Hanani, my brother, and Hananiah, the commander of the fortress, in charge of Jerusalem. For he was a faithful man and feared God for uh, more than many. Then I said to them, Do not let the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot, and while they are standing guard, let them shut and bolt the doors. Also appoint guards for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, each at his post, and each in front of his own house. Now the city was large and spacious, but the people in it were few, and the houses were not built. So they built the, they built the wall, 
but the place was still vulnerable because they didn't have very many people in it and there weren't very many houses in it. And so they wanted to make sure that everything was protected and that they weren't going to get overrun and the wall destroyed like, because they had many enemies. I mean, if you go back and read the first part of Nehemiah, there were many people that stopped them, tried to stop them from building the wall in the first place because they didn't want the Jews coming back. And so consequently, he had to put the, the guards on duty. But the thing I want to point out is the wall was built 52 days, it's done. Now we're going to jump to chapter 8, just subsequent to this, and look what it says, because this actually talks about the day we're talking about today. Chapter 8, starting at verse 1. I got a little drink of water here before we read this. And all the people gathered as one man at the square, which is in front of the water gate, and they asked Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Now, let's go back one verse, because you notice the last verse of the previous chapter says, and when the seventh month came, the sons of Israel were in their cities. So this is the beginning of the seventh month. This is the first day. This is Rosh Hashanah, although it's not called that back then. Picking up at the second verse. Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could listen with understanding on the, what's it say? First day of the seventh month, Rosh Hashanah, Okay. And he read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gate, from early morning until midday. How long would that be? When does, the, when does this day start for the typical Israelite? Well, it starts at 6 a.m. And this is midday. I'm guessing 12 noon? Six hours. How many would like, me to stay, have, would like to come here and listen to me read the scriptures for six hours? How many would stay awake while I read it? <laughs> okay. Uh, this is what they're doing, put it, to put it in perspective. So... Uh, where was I? Verse uh, 3, halfway through. The morning until midday, in the presence of men and women, those who could understand, and all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood at a wooden podium, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood, and it lists all the guys that stood before him. And I would like to pick some of you to read the, uh, John, you want to read all those names for me? <laughs> no, no, we're going to skip the names, okay? But those names were important because those were people that were known in, the, in that, and I think it's important that, that they record those, those names in Scripture. So all these guys are standing beside him, um, and they're the leaders of Israel who say, this is important. Verse, six, or verse 5, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people at this podium. And when he opened it, all the people... Okay, when we read the Word of God earlier today, what would we do? We stood up. I think it's appropriate that when we read God's word in a public forum that we stand up. And they read it. They stood up in order to honor God's word. And then, then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered and okay, let's do it better. And all the people answered Amen, amen, amen. okay. While lifting up their hands. Is it okay to lift up hands while you're singing in church? A lot of people think you should hold them in the pockets and you can't do anything, you know. They lifted up their hands, okay, in worship of God. And then also, what does it say, if you followed here? Then they bowed low and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, and they list a whole bunch of other people here in the Levites they, that were kind of teachers. They explained the law to the people while the people remained in their place. They didn't move. They stayed right there and listened. And they read from the book from the law of God, translating it to give the sense so that they understood the meaning. So I'm, I'm thinking some of the people didn't understand the Hebrew, the language. You know, some of them from Babylon. Maybe, they, maybe, maybe they're reading the Hebrew. Maybe they're, some of them were Aramaic speaking and so forth. So they had different, different words. So they made sure they understood it. So that's what, that's what we try to do in a church, okay? When you come to church, I try to explain the word of God to you, okay? Um, uh, maybe you understand it perfectly. Maybe you need a little bit of explanation. Maybe it's not quite understood. So that's what the preacher tries to do on a Sunday. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of a, of a detour here, which is not in my notes, but you go to some churches and they'll say, well, you have to use the King James Version of the Bible, okay? This is mandatory, okay? And you go to the, and, and that's sure, they, they base it on, and I'm not going to go on, on all the reason why they say that, but let me just tell you, if you were trying to read the King James Version of the Bible, 1611 edition, you would not be able to read it, period, okay? The thing that you have in your hand, if you have a King James Version, is not the original 1611 version. Anybody in high school or college have to read Chaucer, okay? Do you remember what that was like? You know, I mean, 
you need an interpreter just to read it. I mean, this stuff was old English. The letters were funny because the letters are different. You know, the F looks like an S and I mean, all the other stuff in there. I mean, you can't read it. That's what King James 1611 Bible looked like. So we have to be able to understand it. And so they've continually updated, even though we think they think the 1611 edition is what they're reading. It's really not. They're reading similar words, but it's, it's updated to our vernacular in English. Some other versions have been made, uh, and um, what is important is not that you read a particular version, but that you understand it, and that's what these guys were doing. They were reading a version, they made sure that the people understood it. The version I use that I think is closest to the Greek and Hebrew is the New American Standard Version, okay? That's a, it's a very, uh, it's, it's very close to what uh, we have back then. 1611, they didn't have a lot of the manuscripts we have today. A lot of the archeological finds hadn't been done. And so they've incorporated them. That's the one I think is best. But that doesn't mean there's other, there, you can use other ones also. When we were in the Philippines, Lois and I, we used the Good News Translation. Now don't tell some people, they probably have a heart attack, you know? But the Good News Translation, if you use the New Testament, it was approved by the Catholic Church, which is what most of the Philippines Filipinos are, it's Catholic. And they could understand it because their English is a second language. And so we would use it and they would understand it and people could get saved and could understand it. And it wasn't anything wrong with it, but we just have to realize it's a paraphrase. Now, if you're using the Good News Bible or the Living Bible as your study Bible to study God's Word, I'm going to say, that's probably not the best thing. But go ahead and read it and then come back to this book and say, like, come back to your version and, and read it through it. And you might understand it a little bit better. So using various translations is okay as long as we make sure that they're true to God's word. And most of the translations are fine. I mean, someone asked me the other day, they want a Douay Reims version, I think, or somebody. I know, you know, that's the old Catholic version. They don't even use that anymore. But, you know, it's still God's word, and it's an authentic, good translation. I mean, it's, it's worthwhile. You can get saved. You can come to Jesus Christ through, the, through any of those Bibles except for the New World Translation. Okay? New World Translation is the one the Jehovah's Witnesses used. And they retranslated the Bible to match their theology, so they changed stuff in it that shouldn't be changed. So, but other than that, most of the ones I know of can be lead you to Christ, okay? So they were explaining the word of God here in verse 8. Let's keep on reading. Then verse 9, the Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. Why were they weeping? Why do you think they're weeping? Huh? They realize they weren't keeping the law. The scriptures tell us how to live. They tell us what morality is. They tell us what, you know, what fellowship is like. They tell us how we should, uh, how we should know who God is. They tell us what sin is. And these people realized that they'd gone all these years and they didn't understand so they realized they had to come into what the Bible had to say, and they were mourning for their sin because they wanted to live righteous lives like God wants them to live in the Scriptures. So then we go to verse 10. Then Nehemiah said to them, Go, eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. Um, the sweet. Um, do you feel good when you eat something sweet? Now, you know, trying to lose weight, I'm, and you try to get away from that kind of stuff, and that's not good. Lois got up this morning and what did you, or last night, what did you complain about? We got nothing sweet to eat in this house, you know? That's horrible, you know? You always want something sweet, don't you? Something sweet to eat in the house. Well, I make own concoctions. I take some honey and mix it with some peanut butter, you know, and I get some sweet maybe that way. But, you know, sweet makes you feel good. And so that's what he's saying here. He says, go get something sweet. And in Rosh Hashanah, if you notice on the video, they take apples and dip them in the honey. And the idea to say with that is, have a sweet new year. You know, and so I've brought here some some apple bits and some honey. It looks like half of them were taken, not all of them, from the first service. So you got to take these, or these apples are going to go to waste. I brought these specifically for you, so you could take these, take a fork, dip one in, and dip it in the honey, and it's really good. Okay, Josh will finish them up at home. Probably will. <laughs> anyway, so so as we look at the scriptures here, we find that um, let's see, we're on verse ten. Uh, for this day is holy to the Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. You know that song. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Remember, that's where it comes from, okay? Verse 11, just two more verses. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went away to eat, to drink, to send portions, and to celebrate a great festival. 
because they understood the words which had been made known to them. Then on the second day, it goes talks about the second day, what they did. We're not going to go into that part. But so Rosh Hashanah <clears throat> was a day for, for reading God's word, and as they say in the video, and for Jews, grieving over your sin, getting rid of the sin, but then it's a day of joy because you're looking forward to Yom Kippur. But you need to make sure that your heart's right. And so there are a number of things that came uh, along with that. So I'd just like to keep on going here and give you a little bit of the background from the, from the um, verbal Jewish law, which eventually became the Talmud and the Mishnah and everything else. But they had all these, all these rules that they made up, but some of them um, we have even today. And so let me just explain some of these. First of all, Rosh Hashanah, uh, the significance of the shofar and the ram's horn. Let me go in, uh, no, let me go into the uh, Talmud. Um, there are three, um, three books that they say are opened on Rosh Hashanah. Not physical books, but it's the Book of Life. Okay? And there are three things that happen. The first is that the righteous in, are inscribed in the Book of Life. So if you're good, you get inscribed in the Book of Life, according to this. Next slide, guys, if you could. Um, the second category is intermediates, and those are the people that may be good or may be bad or whatever. They're kind of intermediates, and in the, in the Jewish society, they're saying they get a respite for 10 days until Yom Kippur. So by Yom Kippur, it's going to find out whether they're good or bad. And then there's the wicked. And the wicked are blotted out of the Book of Life so on, or forever. So in Rosh Hashanah, you got the good guys, the righteous, which get in the Book of Life automatically, right away. you got the wicked, who get out of the Book of Life right away and never get back in. And then you got the intermediates, which they're going to give you 10 more days to Yom Kippur to find out whether you're good or bad. Almost sounds like the Catholic theology of uh, limbo and purgatory and everything else. Um, that's not scriptural, but it's, it's Jewish thought for Rosh Hashanah. They have these three different things. And what are they thinking of? They're thinking of where do I stand with God because what's coming up? Yom Kippur, okay? So the second thing that I wanted, I wanted to talk about as we're, as we're looking at this particular thing with uh, some of these is that there are other connections that they had. There are three other connects, at least three other connections. They mentioned some of them up here. And if, for instance, um, and this is, uh, don't go to the next slide, guys. I'm just going to give you this. One is the, they say that this is the anniversary of the creation of the world, the creation of Adam and Eve. So they associate that with Rosh Hashanah, and I have no idea why, okay? The second thing they associate with is the sacrifice of Isaac. Isaac was sacrificed, by the way, on Mount Moriah, okay, which winds up being the same mount that the temple's built on. Interesting, interesting connection there. When Isaac, why would the, why would the sacrifice of Isaac be related to Rosh Hashanah? Any idea? Let's go back to the sacrifice of Isaac. What happens? They go onto the top of a mountain. Is he killed? Why isn't he killed? Something was off. What was there caught in the bushes? A ram. What does a ram have on its head? What's a ram's horn called? A shofar, the trumpet. Okay, so the trumpet is used a hundred times on Rosh Hashanah. It's connected with the shofar, and so I think that's why they hook this up with the with the uh, sacrifice of Isaac, which is kind of interesting, because the sacrifice of Isaac is a type of what? Of us, because we deserve death, don't we? But who was our substitute? Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He was the one that was the substitute ram. So as the ram was a substitute for Isaac, so Jesus Christ is our substitute. What a great way in order to talk to your Jewish friends about the meaning of Rosh Hashanah, okay? Let's go. The third thing that kind of mentions is the shofar because it was sounded on Mount Sinai numerous times, if you look in the, in the Torah, the first five books, numerous times when Moses was getting the law. Get, come to the mountain, stay away from the mountain, all this kind of shofar is very connected. So they connected with the Mosaic law, which is one reason why the law was, written, was read. And they need to say, am I obeying the law of God? Okay, that's written here. Now there's three sets of verses that are also read on Rosh Hashanah in the typical Jewish synagogue. And these three sets of verses are verses that praise God as king, verses of remembrance, and verses of blowing the shofar. Okay, so yeah, as you think of the praising God as king, that's the praising him, and the kingship of God is so important. Uh, so that's one of the things. Then you have the remembrances, looking back at your past, maybe looking at your sins, maybe looking at where things are in the past so you can get rid of those. You're going to throw those or cast those away. And then there's the, the blowing of the shofar 100 times on that one day alone on Rosh Hashanah. So all those three things are important. 
There are some other customs I want to mention here. One is um, they blow the shofar every day, once a day in the previous month of Elul. We already talked about that. Leading up to remind people, the shofar reminds people Rosh Hashanah is coming. So is Yom Kippur. Get ready. Once a day during the month. Prepare yourself. You know, I actually thought of the, kind of like Lent, you know, preparing yourself for Easter and for Good Friday and so forth. But that, so the month of Elu, with their, they're blowing the shofar. The other thing they do, eat something sweet, okay? So that's why I brought the apple. So take one of these and uh, dip it in some honey on your way out, and you can throw your, for, your forks out up there. But it's a, it's a way to, again, think of the, uh, of the sweetness and uh, have a good feeling about the new year, Rosh Hashanah. Uh, a third thing a lot of men do uh, is the eve before Rosh Hashanah, they will immerse themselves in a mikvah. Now, a mikvah is like a tub that you'll find in a Jewish home a lot of times, a kind of a, almost like a baptistry like we have, okay? And I find it interesting here because a lot of people, um, we, of course, believe in baptism by immersion. People say, well, did they, they didn't immerse back then, you know, whatever did they do. They really did. They had, just like today, they had mikvahs, and immersing themselves was a sign of getting rid of sin and losing their sin and, and washing it away, you know? And so on Rosh Hashanah Eve, Eve's important, right? We have Christmas Eve, we have All Hallows Eve, Halloween, what's that before? All Saints Day. So get ready for All Saints Day, you have All Hallows Eve with all the devils and demons and everything else kind of thing. So the Eve before becomes important. So the Eve before the men would immerse themselves in the mikvah as a symbol, cleansing themselves, getting ready for Rosh Hashanah to come. And so the symbolism, the symbol, uh, symbolism that Jesus and John the Baptist had in baptism and what we do today is very clear and it's, very, and, it, and it's there. Most people don't make those connections, but it's really there. They just don't understand it. But the mikvah and the and immersion is actually a part of the Jewish ceremony for some dedicated Jewish men preparing for this day. The third thing we have is that they cast lint out of their pockets. Now, I don't have too many, I tried it the other day and I had a lot of lint in my pocket. I mean, you know, it's just like, you know, you wash your clothes, but you get a little bit of lint in the bottom of it kind of thing. And in case you don't, they add some bread there. And that's what it talks about. So they go to, the, they go to, the, um, to some running water, and they pull up, turn the poppies upside down, and they pull out the lint. Oh, I got some little bit of lint. Look at that. Okay, I'm going to drop it right here. Who's cleaning the church this week? There you go. You gotta, there it goes. But they'll, they'll take the lint and, and, uh, and, or bread, and they'll take it out of their pockets. But, and that's the, stuff, that's the stuff that nobody knows about. Or the stuff that's, you know, just left over. You know, stuff, the bad stuff in your pocket that the thing get cleansed out. You take it out, you throw it in the water, and the running water runs it away. So it's got to be clear running water, which that one instance where they had here look like a lake, and that really wouldn't work a whole lot in the Jewish system because it had to be running water and carry it away. The third thing that they, um, another thing they do was um, that symbols guys cast, well, the casting off of their sins. Let me give you a verse for that. Math, uh, Micah 7, 19 says, he will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. So that's, that's, the, that's kind of the, the, the Micah 719 is the text they use to kind of uh, show that that's what they're going to do is cast in the sea. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring an application to us a little later on that relates to that. So remember, the fourth thing we want to look at is the significance of the shofar's ram horn. As I said, it's, it's uh, blown 100 times on Rosh Hashanah. It's also say, sometimes associated with a feast, which is called the Feast of, anybody? No? Huh? Yeah. Nope. Not tabernacles, not, not booze. Trumpets. Feast of trumpets. Why would it be really Feast of trumpets? Because there's so many trumpet blows, okay? Shofar, ram's horn, okay? So... Um, the blowing of the shofar is talked about a couple times at, at other places in the scriptures, like the Psalms. And if uh, the next slide will have those Psalms for you, you can read them along with me. Psalm 81, 3 to 4. Guys, next slide, please. It says, blow the trumpet at the new moon, okay? And that's what the seventh month, uh, first day is, new moon, okay? Blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon, or, and on our feast day. For it is a statute for Israel and an ordinance for the God of, our Jake, of Jacob. Psalm 98, 4 to 6. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth and sing with joy and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with a lyre, with a lyre and the sound of the melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn or the ram's horn. Shout joyfully before the Lord, the King. Now, it was also associated with two very uh, well-known events, uh, battles in the Old Testament. Oftentimes, a ram's horn was called people to battle and so forth. Uh, what might be the first one? 
Yes, Joshua in the battle of Jericho, okay? Give a hula there, Josh. <laughs> okay, uh, Joshua, the, Joshua and Jericho, okay? They march around the thing, but they blow the horns. They said that at the last time, you know, in fact, I think, I haven't read this story for a while. They're supposed to be silent for the first time. So then all of a sudden, blow the ramps. I mean, that was scared the living daylights out of you, let me tell you. And we'll find out in a second. Go to the next slide, if you will, guys. There was a second time when it happened. What was that? Any? Gideon, right. Gideon. He said, get rid of everybody else. You've got to get down to the basic 300 guys, and then they're to take what? Three things with them. A lamp, a shofar, or, or the, the ram's horn, or the trumpet, and third was a light. Okay? Remember? And they stood around the camp in these hundred, three groups of a hundred kind of thing, and they broke the pitcher, which made a loud crashing sound. They held the lights, they shouted, and they blew the ram's horn and scared the living daylights out of everybody. And all the, the guys all killed themselves, and they won the victory. Okay? But it was, a, it, was a, it was a tremendous thing. The shofar was, again, a real important time. Now, I'm going to, before we go into the last point here, I want you just to hear a little bit more of what the shofar sounds like. Okay? You'll like this, uh, Carmina. Um, but, uh, and, and, and all you musicians out here. But um, listen to what it sounds like. The first one demonstration is what they'll be like at their service tomorrow morning. Uh, so listen to it, and you'll see what, what it's like to be in a Hebrew service. Okay. Now the next one I think is only it's only 50 seconds long, but I think it does a little bit better job because of of showing the range. I mean that's all the same note coming out of it. I don't know if the guy can play the other notes or what, but I mean this the, the Rams one really is a big range, and so I I picked this one because I think it'll show you the big range it has. He'll also show you the different ones, the short the short staccato things as well as the the three blasts. So go ahead with the next one, if you guys would please. True. Kia Gadola Yeah, give him a hand. He did a good job, didn't he? So, uh, so you wind up with quite a, quite a range as you look at the as as you look at what they play. And so the shofar, you can imagine that being played, and how that might have been uh, how that might have scared the people, you know, on Jericho as they went down and took uh, took over that and uh, particular place. Um, what I would like to do at this point, I think, uh, is just go to the next slide, and uh, I want to I want to I was going to do this in tears, but I'm going to put them all up there. Just look at the first one with me. Um, I didn't blank out the rest. Uh, there are some meanings and applications I think I'd like to apply for us. The first one is, we should start out the Jewish New Year with Messiah Jesus. If you're here to Jesus, to, with us today, you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You need to, okay? Uh, he is the only way. Um, the, the idea of Rosh Hashanah is that we have sin. We have guilt. How do we get rid of it? The Jewish person does not have a way to do that. Even as we talk about Yom Kippur next week, you'll see, you know, they do not have one that will, they, 
I'm not going to say that because that might be taken by the, <laughs> Pastor Bob Rob's the sermon the next week. But they cannot do, take away sin, okay? So there's a way to take away sin, and that's only through Messiah Jesus giving his life on the cross, okay? He was perfect, and he could take away sin. So we should start out the Jewish New Year with Messiah Jesus. So if you don't know him, you need to look back at, your, at the scriptures, and we can easily show you that. I need to understand how it is to become a Christian. You can do this with your Jewish friends. They need to understand Rosh Hashanah is a time to recognize your sins, your, your failures, and get rid of them. And there's one way to do that, Messiah Jesus. There's a couple of verses I'll give to you here. John 6, 37, Jesus Christ speaking, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. All you need to do is come to Jesus, and he will accept you. He will forgive you. That's all it takes. Jesus Christ also said in John 14, 6, say it with me, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's the only way. The Jews don't like that. Many people don't like that. They don't like the exclusivism of it. But he is the one who lived the perfect life and gave his life on the cross, Messiah Jesus, Messiah Yeshua. Someday the Jews will recognize that during the Great Tribulation. But we want them to recognize that before that right now. The second thing we want to point out is that God has removed our sin as far as the east is from the rest. In Psalm 103, 12, it says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I'm glad he did not say from the, as from the north to the south. Is there a north pole? Is there a south pole? I don't know the distance, but I know there's a fixed distance between the two. How, di how far of a distance is it between the east and the west? You can take, a, you can take an air capsule of a NASA, a NASA capsule and go around the world 55 times and you'll never find the east, you'll never find the west. When they cast their bread or their lint into the fast-moving waters, it goes away, but you, it's still someplace. But Jesus Christ takes our sin away from the east, it's from the west. There's a Casting Crown song that talks about that. And I, it's one of my favorites. Just to, you know, how much does he love you? Well, he put out his hands as far as the east is from the west. That's how much he loves us. And the third thing that we saw is the next sound of the trumpet for us is the upward call of heaven. That's going to be the shofar we look for. That is going to be an exciting one. It's going to be one that's going to be outstanding above all the other shofar blasts you've ever heard. And there's two verses that I'm going to read for as we close here. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable, and we all shall be changed. And then, my favorite probably, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17, talking about the rapture of the church, the end times, it says this, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a... Okay, now let's do that better. The Lord will descend from heaven with a... And with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, the shofar, and the dead in Christ will rise first. It's going to, the shout, the archangel, and the shofar is going to be enough to raise the dead. The dead in Christ is going to be raised. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. We're looking for that final shofar. Not the hundred that are going to take place tomorrow in many Jewish temples, but for that final one that's going to say, if you know Jesus Christ, we're headed to heaven. Don't bother getting your bags ready because you're not going to need them. <laughs> we're gone. As we close the day, I want to uh, leave this final, this final uh, theme with you. Um, guys, next slide, if you would. The trumpet calls us to repentance and faith in Messiah Yeshua, Jesus. We're sinners. We need to repent of our sins. If we have ongoing sin, we need to get rid of it, but our sin is forgiven under the blood. And recognize that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. That's the trumpet that we, we need to hear. Dear Lord, we just thank you for the trumpet call that you've given us, both in the scriptures, and we wait for that trumpet call that will take us to heaven. We ask that as we look at the scriptures, and especially as the, as the uh, Jewish friends and, and the Jewish people tomorrow um, celebrate Rosh Hashanah, we ask that you might be able to, in some way, show some of them that Messiah Jesus has already come and has paid the penalty. And they don't need to sacrifice lambs or, or find some ways to make atonement anymore because Jesus Christ has made the final and full atonement for all of our sins. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. Please stand with us as we worship once again.
thank you, Lord, for your word, and we, we recognize the, the significance of the, the celebration, Rosh Hashanah, but Lord, we also recognize the significance of Jesus the Messiah, who came and he gave all, and Jesus, we thank you, and we can even begin to understand exactly um, how that was but we recognize that it's everything for us and uh, may we stay in the word and remember the significance of not only the Old Testament but of Jesus the Messiah as we leave this place this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There's a prayer partner. With something bubbling inside of you, spilling over cause your life is full. How incredible, undeniable.